I do a lot of these things and, and, and I, and I get prepared for the interview and I try and structure it. And I got to say, this is one of the more difficult ones for me to prepare for. (laughs) Not, not in a sense that, that you were difficult or there wasn't a lot of information about you. It's, it's almost completely the opposite. Because I want to be able to to do all the things that I like to do with my subjects here, Ian. Um, the origin stories, uh, you know, your process, uh, your life, things that people may not know about you. Get a, get to know Ian Eagle a little better. But I know so much, <laughs> and I know so many of your stories, <laughs> and I so that curiosity isn't there so much for me. Well, it's been great being on with you, Chris. Thanks. This was terrific. <laughs> so yeah, you can you can go now, and I'm just going to tell your story. Uh, <laughs> no, and I didn't want it to delve too much into um, you know inside stuff or inside jokes and things like that. But uh, it, this all comes out of us being together for almost 30 years. Uh, That's insane. As, insane, you, right? As part of the, the the radio or TV broadcast, and I think about that kid that's maybe 10 or 12 that became a net fan in the mid nineties. Yeah. Like when they're, they're, they're now adults with families. And when the thing that's been constant in their life is when they turn on the TV at night to watch their favorite team play, they're listening to you. Do you, do you ever think about that perspective for yourself? I did an appearance at the NBA draft in Brooklyn a few years ago. And part of the appearance was meeting with fans and it was wonderful. It's always great to, talk with people that have a connection in some way. But one of the people that was waiting online and shakes my hand and said, Ian, so great to meet you. Just want to tell you, grew up watching you. And I'm looking at him thinking, dude, you're older than me. Like, <laughs> yes. You're you're bald. You have grandchildren. <laughs> There's no possible way you grew up watching me. But somehow the math didn't work and he did or i'm yeah. benjamin button no. i'm not sure it's one or the other i have an appreciation for it there's no doubt i think chris you understand this and there's probably going to be a lot of times where i'm saying this over the course of our conversation that you can relate but it doesn't feel like that long to me even though i know the numbers are what the numbers are you and i met in 1994, officially met at a Hoolahan's, the one that the Nets always used to frequent, Nets staff members, some yeah. Nets players and Secaucus. coaches in Secaucus. You and I had a, a, a relationship prior to that because you were producing the Nets from the studio on the radio. So I only knew you through the headset. And I think back now, it feels like yesterday in some ways, and then it feels like a lifetime ago. It's that yeah. duality that sometimes can just blow your mind. Well, when we met, we we're, we're in our 20s. And, you know, think of all the things that have happened in our lives that's happening to the audience. And it's the same as life. It just happens so gradually. And then you get to a point and you go, wow, I was, you know, my dad's age. What, you know, how old was my dad when he was my son's age? That, you start to do that kind of math. Yeah. And it really is amazing. <laughs> you know, you mentioned Hulahan, you mentioned the old Nets days. We were recently, the two of us uh, were, were interviewed for the podcast series, another podcast series called um, Something to Prove. And it was about those 2002 finals team, the 2003 finals team, which was very kind of early in our careers. Um and you, we can get into how you don't want to take for granted those things that are happening as they're happening because you never know when they're going to come around again. Um, but I do love that the fact that now in Brooklyn over a decade, which is amazing to me as well, is that the, the franchise is sort of embracing the history again yeah. of New Jersey. Um, it was nice to go back down memory road for those. And you hear Raph doing the, the narration of the podcast, right? <laughs> yeah, which, which was, was amazing. Uh, it, it kind of brought it all back. And it was hard to believe that that was 20 years ago, but that was such an amazing period. Not many franchises have teams like that, that yeah. were so beloved and so good. Young players like 
Richard Jefferson, <laughs> Jason Collins. It was great. It Aaron was great Williams. hearing him do it. And, you know, it's funny. You have a segment of the population that has no idea that Bill was connected to the Nets for all yeah. those years because so much time has passed. By the time I started working with Bill, he already had a long, long history with the organization. And to see it get to the point that you and I experienced with the team being of championship caliber, the fact that it happened in what turned out to be Raf's last year really was icing on the cake in many ways. And for Bill, obviously life has has so many beautiful moments for him post nets to be the voice of the final four and to be one of the most respected and beloved analysts in sports, not just college basketball or NBA, but there's still a part of him that, that has very deep feelings and emotions for the net. So just a lot of that conversation brought back those memories and the memories that you and I have with him on the road, which are memories that we'll never forget because those are real life happenings. Yeah. They're not just basketball <laughs> things that we catalog in our brain. These are real stories of dinner and gatherings and drinks and laughs and the bus. You know, that's what fills all the gaps in, in our lives, not just doing <laughs> the games. The games are what everybody else experiences with us, but it's the behind the scenes that really makes the job what it is. So the appreciation I have for that time is really a combo of the professional side and the personal side. The professional side, you and I were walking into arenas that the Nets never got any respect in. And then all of a sudden, Opposing broadcasters, PR directors, media wanted to talk to us about the Nets and what yeah. makes them so good. It felt very surreal for anyone who had experienced the team prior to that. And then on the personal side, uh, this is what makes you who you are as a human being is those moments. And it's the aggregate total of those that produce. Uh, the joy you have in life, and then uh, also the uh, the the personal relationships that will never be broken. Those are bonds that live forever, and that's probably the part that's even more special in a way because it, it's truly personal. You know, when you 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 bring that up, there are a couple of things I want to go back to. The, I was hoping that Raf would tell the story in uh, in the podcast series about. Um, right before that finals game one, do you remember oh, having yeah. dinner with him, me, you, him, um, and Todd McCullough <laughs> and his father? Yes. Right. Yes. And 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 Raph yelling down to the table, "Hey, Todd, have another steak. You got a good shack tomorrow." Exactly. <laughs> it's the <laughs> night before game one. So the two things that strike me about that story. Uh, we were staying at the Marina Del Rey Ritz, mm -hmm. which was probably the most popular of the hotels back then, before LA Live grew and some hotels popped up in the downtown area. And I get a call in my room. This is really pre-cell phone where you would reach out to people in that manner. So the phone rings in the hotel room, which now feels, if you're in a hotel room and your phone rings, you're like, whoa, what's... What's going on here? Back what then, it was yeah, it was pretty common. So I pick up the phone and I say hello, and the person on the other end says, uh, "Other end says, uh, hey, Ian, it's T Mac." And I'm thinking, what? Tracy McGrady? Uh, who? What? <laughs> yes. I said, okay. So I'm playing it cool. He says, "Hey, I just saw." Bill Raftery in the lobby, he told me that you guys are going to dinner. What time are you meeting? And now I'm thinking, is this a fan that Bill met? And Chris, as you know, yeah. that could absolutely happen yeah. where Bill would run into someone or someone he knew from 10 years earlier and say, hey, we're going to dinner. You should join us. Yeah. So I'm not really sure how to proceed. 
And I said, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what time we're meeting. He said, oh, that's weird because he, he said uh, you would know. Okay, I'll just see you later. I went, yeah, you got it. And I hang up the phone and that was it. I'm like, okay, I don't know what that was. <laughs> About 20 minutes later, I head downstairs. You're down there and Raph's down there and Frank DeGrace, our Nets producer, is down there. And Todd McCullough is down there. So I go directly up to Todd. By the way, one of the nicest professional athletes, forget about athlete, one of the nicest human beings I've ever met in my life. I said, hey, Todd, what's up? He's like, hey. He goes, man, you were weird on the phone. <laughs> I said, what? He said, yeah, I just talked to you. I go, you're T-Mac? <laughs> he goes, yeah. I'd never I said, heard of, he'd never referred to himself as T-Mac. Todd, I, I've just covered you for a full season. <laughs> you have never been called T-Mac. I've never heard you refer to yourself. He was like, yeah, I'm trying it out. (laughs) That's the first part. So then we go to this Italian restaurant in LA, not that far from the hotel. And we're really having a great time. A lot of laughs. Yeah. And Todd's dad is with him. And Bill is peppering Todd and talking about, you matched up with Shaq tomorrow. And I'm thinking the whole time, like, this guy is going against Shaquille O'Neal tomorrow in the NBA Finals. And he's hanging at dinner with us and laughing and telling stories. And towards the end of the dinner, Todd's dad, who was fairly quiet, but very nice demeanor, turns to me and says, hey, uh, I have a bone to pick with you. And I I said, you have a bone to pick with me. And now everybody's listening at the table. Like, what what could possibly be at issue between Todd McCullough's dad and Ian? He says, you've been saying our name wrong the whole season. I said, what? No. I I say, McCullough, Todd McCullough. He goes, no, no, no. He said, it's McCulloch. (laughs) I said, well, sir, I actually went to Todd before the season, just to confirm, like I do with all players and the PR staff, how do you say your name? He said, it's McCullough. And then his dad said, well, he doesn't know. <laughs> well, I, oh, I got to well, interrupt then. you here, though. No, no, because I remember that because we had this out that year before the season, because when we in, in training camp, I would get the guys to record these, you know, the liners for the radio. Hey, I, yeah. hi, I'm Ian Eagle and you're listening to Nets Pass, whatever. So. We'd known Todd as Todd McCullough his whole career with Philadelphia. And he had comes in and he sits down and he does the, the tag for me. And he says, hi, I'm Todd McCulloch. And this is, and I went, whoa, whoa, wait. I said, Todd, did you say McCulloch or McCullough? He goes, I said McCulloch. And I go, wait, we've always said your name McCullough. He goes, yeah, well, kind of the men, the family say McCulloch and, and, and the women say McCullough. So, you know, I don't really care. And I'm like, Fantastic. well, how do you say it? He goes, well, I say McCulloch. So I remember going to you and like I am. And this is my first year on radio. I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just like, you're the veteran here. I'm like, I am, what do we do? He, he says McCulloch. Uh, and you're like, yeah, but everybody knows him as McCulloch. Does he really care? It, no, he said you could say it either way. He goes, well, then we yeah. should say it the way it's always been said. And yeah. I didn't, and I forgot that his father brought that up to you. He his did. father was also a very large man, by the way, too. Large man, yeah. Yes. So, yes. <laughs> so yeah. So these are the, these are the kind of things that that we did go through. But it was like Todd, like he was so nice. Oh yeah. He just didn't. Get, he was like, yeah, whatever. Yeah, I mean, I went to him early in the season. I said, yeah. eh, which way? He goes, eh, no, just go with whatever you're going with. Yeah. And it's funny because even to this day. Chris, you pride yourself on pronunciation. I do as well. And I do for a number of reasons. It's professional. And then second, because my first name has been mispronounced (laughs) basically my whole life. And it doesn't bother me by any stretch. And at some point, I I really don't correct people. I'm, I'm cool with it. But I do recognize for someone, if it matters to them, I want to get it right. So even... This year, with the Knicks playoff run, when I was doing the games on TNT, I watch video. There's this one site that I know you use, I use as well, where the players look into the camera and say the pronunciation of their name. And Isaiah Hartenstein says it like that. Yeah. Hartenstein. 
And for years, people had called him Hartenstein, but mm -hmm. I went off the pronunciation and I was getting a lot of feedback, whether it was social media or just friends of mine that were texting me during the Nick playoff game. Like, well, you're really leaning into the Stein. <laughs> I was like, well, <laughs> that's his name. So I do my best to respect the wishes of those that want it pronounced a certain way. You're right. Todd was very passive in that. He's like, ah, yeah, yeah. whatever. Yeah, my well, color works. There's a couple of things. First of all, I I know you relish leaning into heart and shine. I do. Yeah, I do. I do the same I thing. Do. Yeah, I so. do. I enjoy it. I'm not going <laughs> to yeah. deny it. Yeah. I enjoy it. Absolutely. But I want to uh, get it right. Also. Yeah, no, I, that is yeah. The, that is the thing. And the, the 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 quick story about Todd McCullough or McCulloch, funny, was that after that season ends, he he had. I remember we did a show together at we talked about Hands. We would do this show once a month on radio, and he and he was nice enough after the season. Right? I mean, right there, you just all you need to know after this like yeah. season that went two months longer than any other season, he comes and hangs out with me to do the show at uh, Hands. And uh, during a commercial break or something, he just said something like, uh, hey, you going on vacation or anything? I said, yeah, you know, me and me and Laura, we're going to go to Aruba. Oh, well, when are you going? And he goes, I said this week, whatever. He goes, oh, we're going to I'm going to be on a on a cruise. And I think it stops in Aruba. I'll I'll check in on you. See, you know, hang out. I'm like, All right. I'm thinking, all right, I forget about it. Like two weeks later, go by yeah. at the hotel. Same thing. There's a message on the phone when we get back from like the beach and it's a message and it's Todd. And he's like, Hey, Chris, you know, we're in Aruba tonight. Um, not sure if you're around, but we made an eight o'clock reservation at this. It was like this Brazilian steakhouse. Uh, if you're around, maybe come on it. All right, great. Show up. There he is. Him and his, him and his Amazing. girlfriend. I think they just got married. Uh, and we had this unbelievable time and, you know, people there were, uh, he, he he electrified the place because he's so tall and people yeah. knew he was a basketball player. want to take pictures with him. And he was so nice to everybody. Uh, yeah, really, really cool. Um, and I heard the people at the restaurant, uh, people from Aruba <laughs> and also those visiting were just chattering. That, That's T-Mac. <laughs> Can you believe it? <laughs> T-Mac is here. <laughs> Do you say his name McCullough or McCulloch? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> um, you touched on something earlier before we digressed into Todd McCullough, McCulloch stories. Um, about what those finals appearances did for the Nets as a franchise. Yeah. And on a personal note, I, I feel like, you know, when, when, we were, when we were starting and we were at that moment in our careers, we're young. We're we're in our twenties. We're you know I'm thirty when I start with the Nets. I think I was the youngest guy, radio guy in the league at the time. I'm sure you yep. were the youngest TV guy when you started. Definitely. Um, we had these 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 uh, you know, we had these dreams of what we wanted to do in this business. Uh, you have gotten to a point where you are one of the the top, you know, handful of of sports broadcasters in the country at the time though a lot of organizations like the nets or similar franchises that you were thinking of at the time young broadcasters kind of use those jobs as stepping stones you know use those jobs to get the next job you know i think prior to me taking over prior to you taking over there have been guys who had been nets broadcasters who did that you know just always I'm going to do it for a couple of years and then something bigger is going to come along. And, mm -hmm. and I almost feel like not that we were ever looking to, to go somewhere else, but suddenly the, the marquee value of what we did changed, right? Like you, the, the franchise went to the finals. This was now no longer the afterthought. This was one of the, the, the franchises that's gone to the finals that had a chance to win a championship, it suddenly changed, I think, the way we looked at our positions now. And maybe in some, you know, way in the back of our brains, you know, being the voice of this franchise for three decades on radio, on TV, it, it now, that now meant something that maybe it, we didn't see that back then. 
Yeah, it definitely raised the profile, no doubt. At that point of my career, I was really just so thrilled to be doing games consistently, to be working with people that I really enjoyed their company. And that's the lens that I, I viewed the job through. That was a bonus, that the Nets were actually good was a bonus. Mm. I had not experienced any sustained success on the court. And what it taught me as a broadcaster back then was one can't have anything to do with the other. Some of my best seasons, I thought, as a broadcaster were some of the worst seasons the Nets had on the court because I had to come up with ways to inform and entertain and keep it light and keep it moving and try to keep people engaged and interested. Mm. And that was really ingrained in my head from very early on. So I benefited greatly because Bill Raftery was doing the analysis and it was always fun. And if it wasn't Bill, it was Jim Spinarco. And it was also fun. So the on-air presentation had less to do with the result and more to do with the chemistry and the preparation and the subject matters that we were tackling. But when they started winning, it felt like a different job in many ways. It felt easier. The games were doing themselves. If you couldn't, if you couldn't capture the excitement and the highlights that this team was churning out on a nightly basis, then you shouldn't be doing broadcasting for a living was the way that that I looked at it. And I just felt a difference in how it was being received. We had more of a, of a large scale interest around the league. And I know, again, you can relate to this, but we have conversations with broadcasters from the other team before every game. You know, some are longer than others. You, you form relationships. Some are quick, some are longer. And they'll often ask about your team, your life, and then vice versa. And on the net side of things for so many years, the conversation was always like, yeah, tough one, huh? That was always the lead in <laughs> yeah. for us. And I had never allowed that to affect the overall point of view if other teams were struggling and I would ask the broadcaster, hey, how's it going? And I meant more really in their life. And they would go deep, deep, deep into, wow, we, we just are help defense. I'm like, oh, I don't. That's not, <laughs> that's not really. I kind of wanted to know like how your kids were doing. Yeah. I mean, I was yeah. trying to break through on a personal level. Uh, but I just found that the conversations around the league were changing. There was an aura that was forming around the Nets and a mystique. A lot of it was based on Jason Kidd and just his sheer will and what he brought to that team and the fact that everybody followed him. But it did spill over into the broadcast booth because, you know, I found myself having to get creative in <laughs> describing what was happening on the court, having a front row seat for those moments made me a better broadcaster and also made me understand how it all works to some degree. Highlights, the Nets were not getting a whole lot of those. When the NBA did their top 10 at the end of every week, the Nets were rarely a part of it. And back in 2001, 2002, 2003, you didn't have the access online that you have today to just go back and listen to whatever broadcast you want to listen to. It was a big deal. If your call got on the top 10 and that year, everything changed. Uh, the yeah, call I, started popping up a lot. I look back on some of those highlights from those Jason Kidd years and they're almost even more incredible than I, than I thought at the time. Yeah. You know, it was almost like maybe when it was happening in real time and because it was kind of out of nowhere and, you know, we just starting in our careers. It was like, wow, this is, you know, I'm sure that was just, that was what we thought it was always going to be. Yeah. And I look back and I go, this stuff looks different than anything I've seen in the last 20 years. 
I would agree. Uh, they definitely had a revolutionary way to play, which was run every opportunity you had. We had seen it with Showtime and yeah. the Lakers and some other teams that that pushed the pace, the Denver Nuggets as well. But I don't know if they did it with the synchronization that the Nets found so quickly because of the personnel. Richard Jefferson could run all day. Kenyon Martin could run all day. Kerry Kittles could run all day. So this was their first instinct. And it got to another level when they started to figure out how to play with Jason Kidd. Kidd was doing things that they just hadn't seen before. And, and quite frankly, I had not seen before. I had seen great highlights. I had done games with Michael Jordan. And you know, I was fortunate where I got that dose of Jordan and then into the Kobe Bryant years, into the LeBron James years and Steph Curry years. So uh, I look over the 30 years as you do and you realize, wow, uh, I've, I've been so incredibly fortunate to call games involving some of the greatest players of all time. But my experience with those guys was a game here, a game there, not a season's worth of watching someone that was a surgeon. Uh, he, he truly was. What he did, you, you can't you can't have a three-hour podcast if we did that right now and still give all of the reasons why Jason Kidd changed the franchise the way that he did. It, it was a metamorphosis of epic basketball proportions. And it, it happened organically. You know, it was it was he was he was traded coming out of a circumstance where the, yep. the Suns felt they needed to move him. Um, and the Nets, you know, there wasn't that expectation. When Jason Kidd showed up, there wasn't that expectation. Oh, this is going to put them in the finals now. That was no. the last thing that people thought. It was like, well, no. is he going to rehab his image? Is he going to be that player? And I, I'll use that as a segue into what we've gone through now in recent years with the Nets, where when when Kyrie Irving, Kevin Durant sign, there was it. I don't think there's ever been an expectation level like that going into a season or a, a group of seasons. Um, and I don't know that that team, even as we know, we didn't see the it, it, we didn't see it whole enough when we did, it was pretty amazing. Yep. Um, but never is going to, you know, never is going to uh, be in the heart of net fans like those Jason Kidd teams. Um, so you're coming out of this, you know, because kind of just bringing it to where we are now. We're coming out of this. Uh, we see what's gone on with even some of these former Nets now. Um, as we're taping this, you know, James Harden news is coming out that yeah. calling Daryl Morey a liar and not wanting to go back to the Sixers, all this kind of stuff. And we see the the current net players like Mikel Bridges and Cam Johnson uh, representing themselves so well on the world stage right now, representing Team USA. Um, I don't know this team isn't doesn't have the the odds to win a championship like the former team, but it it feels like a bit of a palate cleanse, <laughs> doesn't it? Right now. Yes, like sorbet. Yes, between right at the end of the meal at a dinner. Yeah, yeah, Chris. It, it feels a little bit like a fever dream. <laughs> like you know what happened, yeah, and you try to piece together how we got here. And I personally wouldn't trade it. I know that it was very circuitous, and it was arduous. And there were some really incredible moments and there were some embarrassing moments uh, for the franchise and maybe even for the fan base. But I wouldn't trade any of it, to, to be perfectly honest. From a broadcast standpoint, it was a blast. Yeah, Kyrie Irving is one of the most talented human beings I've ever seen on a basketball court, calling his games professionally was at the height of what we do. Kevin Durant, 
Hall of Famer, one of the best to ever do it, professional uh, from a basketball point of view, so enjoyable to watch the precision in which he does his job. James Harden, gifted, exceptionally talented, uh, mercurial, but boy, could do things on on the court that uh, you just can't simulate. You nailed it. We just didn't see a whole lot of them together. And with everything that happened surrounding it, never getting to the mountaintop. Really close. The Buck series, uh, you can look back on and literally it's a matter of inches and it changes so many people's lives, careers. The Milwaukee Bucks may not have a championship right now. Giannis may not be in Milwaukee because that relationship would have ended. Mike Budenholzer, who was eventually let go, but stayed on because they won the championship. You know, it's my understanding he would not have been the head coach of that team if Kevin Durant's foot is behind the line. Maybe the Nets win a championship and a lot of the drama goes away because ownership decides, hey, we're going to reward you. We're going to pay you and we're going to ride this thing out and see if we can win a bunch more. But that's not what happened. The, the part that will stick with me more than anything else is the fact that for about a two-year period, I don't want to say for three full years, but two years, the Nets were the biggest topic of conversation in the NBA and sometimes in all of sports. And I never, ever thought I would see that in my lifetime, mm. <laughs> ever. And not always for the right reasons, as we know, but as the hot topic shows have taken on more importance and impact in our sports media world, the Nets were like catnip for, for those programs. And I was, I was just bemused by the fact that the Nets had become that kind of narrative and story around the league. Well, and I, and I think when, when it all, when it first happened, when, you know, the, the, they, when Durant Irving signed and a lot was made of that. And I got emotional, I remember, because it wasn't from a standpoint of I'm thinking, oh, uh, now we're going to win a championship. It was more, um, we know how good it is here. Yep. And now somebody, the, the biggest names in the game were – we're, 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 we're joining it to legitimize the, the franchise again. Yeah. You know, we knew, Hey, listen, we're a franchise that has been to the finals. We're in New York city. We know the, 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 the character, the people that were in ownership and in management, and we know how good it is. We know how well they treat us. We know how well they treat the players. Yeah. We, we know this is a place that everyone should aspire to be. And finally somebody was recognizing that. Yeah. It's a great way to put it, uh, yeah. Chris. And, you know, I think in our roles, it's it's a very interesting place to be in because we are privy to certain information that can't be shared. And you recognize that going in. There are off the record conversations. There are moments on the road that are not for public consumption. And our job is continually walking a very fine line. It's obviously gotten a lot of attention most recently with the Baltimore Orioles and Kevin Brown, who's a really talented broadcaster and a great guy who I've known since his college days, literally at Syracuse and as a professional and has found himself in a difficult set of circumstances based on the relationships and how the lines have been drawn within that franchise and the network and what have you. So we're always navigating that. And there isn't a play-by-play -play announcer out there that isn't. But when you see something develop the way that it has under Sean Marks and now under the size, and you know that they're doing things the right way and trying to do things the right way and handling situations the best way that they can, and others don't have all the information, but are making very strong statements in regards to what's happening, it can be difficult uh, because you know better 
or you know the truth. Yeah. And I think everything you just mentioned, it was building towards something. The Nets were doing so many things the right way, and they needed somebody from the outside, a big name, a big star. They happened to get two of them with Kyrie and Kevin Durant to say, I want to be there. And whatever reasons there were behind that, who's to know? You know, I think KD is a different dude and he's a natural contrarian and he didn't want to do the same old thing and sign with the New York Knicks. He wanted to do something different and he saw the Nets as something different. And in the interim now, as the smoke clears and you look at the roster that they have, are they a championship team today? They're not. But do they have a bunch of really high quality people that they think they can build around and make this something special and do it in a way that you used the word earlier with Jason Kidd organically. That's the difference that I'm feeling behind the scenes. And I give Sean Marks a great deal of credit, not because I do the broadcast on television, because as an observer of the NBA, it's not easy to trade away superstars yeah. and feel like you've gotten back equal value that's in the eyes of the beholder, but value and players that are actually going to stick on your team. What you often see when you trade away superstars is you're just starting over. You're hitting the reset button. You're looking for picks. You have no idea. And it takes years. It requires a TV graphic to say, this is who you got in this deal from seven years ago yeah. because of the way that the NBA is structured now. This is actual real live people that you can see that came from those deals that, that the Nets made. And uh, the Nets are obviously trying to build this a different way now. And the proof is in the pudding. You got to go out and play, but uh, you have to like what the the philosophy is right now and trying to to get back to a place of credibility and also to maintain a fan base and 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 players drive culture to me and and we throw culture around all the time and i think that uh we started to see that right before the the durants and the irvings came in yes and i think that there look at that look at the, the team that went to the playoffs that year and and uh you know Fun. lost in the first round of philadelphia that was just you know, net fans talk about that team like they talk about the Jason Kidd years. I mean, they love that team, you know, and I think you I think you, you want to try and get back to where you're winning and you're doing it with the culture that fans can really get behind. Yeah. And the other part, Chris, you've seen this uh, the same way that I have. Look, you're you're a Jersey guy now through and through. You've lived in this state for a long time. I've lived in this state for a long time. I'm from Queens originally. So if anyone would have told me growing up, hey, one day you're going to be living in New Jersey and you're going to be associated with the state from a sports point of view and your kids will have grown up there, I would have said, you're crazy. <laughs> that, no shot. You know, I was taught that New Jersey was a cesspool. I, I don't know any better. <laughs> That's what you're told as a That's kid harsh. living in New York. No, don't. You don't want to go there. So when the team was moving from New Jersey to Brooklyn, we had so many conversations behind the scenes because there was that two-year run-up when the team was playing in Newark. So all you have really on the road is time to discuss, yeah. all right, what's the logistics going to look like? How are we going to get there? Yes. What are we going to do? Where are we going to fly from? Where are the players going to live? All of these topics were, were part of our, our daily discussions. And I had created a scenario in my head that I didn't like the move. I thought, stay in New Jersey. At least you know you've got your people. Yes, you're competing with the Knicks, but not really. It's a separate entity and a separate vibe. And what I didn't have, and I'll admit it today, is the vision of what it could become, that Brooklyn has its own identity and has pride and the community there truly embraced the franchise. It didn't happen overnight, but what I've noticed, and I know you have the same, there are so many 
new fans that have emerged over the last five, six years, if you're around Barclays Center, I now see people that were 13, 14 when we started doing games there. And they're now adults and some are having kids of their own. And that's how you build an actual fan base. And that part of it, I didn't, I didn't understand because maybe I just had emotional ties, but I see it now and I see the reasons behind it. And it's been a home run on so many levels. It's given them something to really feel strongly about in their connection with Brooklyn. And then obviously the brand has grown from a national standpoint based on a a series of factors. You brought up the mean streets of uh, Forest Hills, Queens, where you (laughs) were from. Oh, you brought up Queens. I brought up the mean streets. Uh, Mean streets. So let's just... I want. I want to. I. I we. We kind of. We've gone on a good topic of talking about the Nets and the franchise, but I, I. I wanted to get into the origin story of Ian Eagle a little bit, <laughs> yes. um, because I think it's as fascinating as anything you've ever done in your in your professional career. Uh, you. You. You're a wonderful father. Let me put it this way: You're a oh. wonderful father. You and Elisa Thanks. have uh, raised a beautiful family. Two very successful children right now in their, in their early twenties. Um, you know, Noah is going to be a superstar in broadcasting. He's already, he's already now achieving high level things like Thanks. being the, uh, the main voice of the big 10 on NBC. And he's going to be working full time now for NBC. Uh, your daughter, Aaron, uh, has been successful in, uh, as a fashion influencer. Um, Taking a little bit from, I know your wife, Elisa, was yep. uh, in that and, and actually worked for the NBA at one point, and you guys met in college. So we can't, we don't have hours to go into the complete Iron Eagle history, <laughs> but I wanted to make sure we mentioned that stuff. Yep. But what I, what I bring it up, being a great father and having a beautiful family, is that you didn't have, um, you didn't, it wasn't leave it to Beaver in terms <laughs> of your, your childhood. Um, yeah. how would you characterize how you, you know, your, your youth and how you were brought up? Unique, very yeah. unique family life, unique upbringing. I just knew what I knew in my family. And it really wasn't until a little bit later that I started to realize, oh, this isn't the way it is for most families. This is all I knew. <laughs> My father was a stand-up comedian, an actor, a musician. My mother, a singer, an actress. So my earliest memories are being on the road with them. Uh, They would do their act. My mom would open as a singer. My father would close as the comedian. Then they would come out together at the end. And eventually, uh, at five, six years old, they would bring me out, put me in a green corduroy handsome suit. I would do five minutes of shtick impressions, Howard Cosell and Muhammad Ali and W.C. Fields brought the house down. (laughs) And this was happening in the Catskill Mountains. So hotels like uh, the Concord, Grossinger, Stevensville, Neville, Fallsview, Homawack, Browns, Kutcher's, you name it. They did all of them. They did bungalow colonies. They did... Uh, those hotels, they went to Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and make sure you say it correctly. It's not Lancaster. Interesting. Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Like Secaucus or, and Secaucus. Exactly. Very yeah. similar. There were hotels there that they did their act. And then my father uh, achieved some greater success in the world of commercials. And he had a stretch, probably a three-year stretch. Chris, anything he went up for, he got. He was that guy. And there's always that that one guy, that one gal that you see on television. Man, I see them in a lot of different spots. He was that person. So 50 different commercials that that he did. A couple of them really took off. One in particular with Xerox where he played Brother Dominic. And that turned into a whole other career of traveling the country, sometimes up to 220 days a year in a monk outfit, going into Kinko's. Or into large corporations, 
Chrysler and being the the conduit between Xerox and the potential client that was looking to bring in Xerox copiers in all of their car dealerships or you know fill in the blank and he was very successful at it because he was a stand-up comedian that loved people he yeah. just loved talking to people and he loved the idea of making them laugh and brightening their day and he crushed it and they were paying him well to do this he had made more money doing that than he had made in all of his years as a stand-up comedian. So really interesting. My mom, parents got divorced, lived to, uh, decided to live on the West Coast. So I was bi-coastal visiting her in LA, coming back to New York, living though with my dad full-time, but really more with a housekeeper, living housekeeper. So all of these different experiences that contribute to making you the person that you are, I was independent at a very young age. I didn't have a choice. I had to be. And because of it, I think it it made me very comfortable in different situations. Uh, meeting big stars, not a big deal. Met a bunch of entertainment people my whole life. So never starstruck over the idea of that. But then on the flip side, dealing with people that helped get my parents on stage, behind the scenes, a lighting person, an audio person, bonding with them at a young age and recognizing that there are a lot of people that make this work, not just the two people that are up on stage. So mm. all of that played a really large role in making me who I was and then also opening the door to the possibility of doing something that wasn't typical yeah. because my parents encouraged it and told me you can do whatever you want to do. I want to be an NBA center. You can't do that. <laughs> I want to be a broadcaster. We might be able to figure out a way to make that happen. So they were just incredibly encouraging and just very positive about it. When you're told at a young age that, well, you're going to do that. Your parents tell you that. Mm. You believe them. <laughs> that's that's the the instinct of the the parent-child relationship. And I just believe them. So I convinced myself that this is what I was going to do. And, and you're, you're, you, you have such great comedic timing. Um, and, and it, whether it be in real life or on the air, I mean, you're a funny guy, you're a funny person. And your dad was a stand up comedian, but was, uh, you have this, you have this dry sense of humor. Was he, was he <laughs> funny in the same way? Do you find similarities? Yeah, it's interesting with him. Um, uh, one thing I noticed with stand-up comedians, most cannot laugh at other stand-up comedians because they're breaking down the material and it's processing yeah. it in real time. Mm, I see what he did there. Yeah. That worked. That didn't. The audience responded to that. They didn't respond to this. My father was a good audience, and that stuck with me. You know, we would watch George Carlin, and his reaction wasn't just, hmm, brilliant, genius, great angle. He laughed. Yeah. He laughed. We would go to the movies. He would laugh. So that resonated with me in, in some way. He was very funny. He was very clever. Uh, that, that was from day one. He could charm the pants out of anybody that would cross over into his life incredibly affable, likable, and could be hilarious. But the interesting part with stand-up comedians, having lived with one and grown up with, with a dad that was doing that for a living, it's not 24-hour shtick and material. A lot of stand-up comedians have another side, and it can be a very serious side. And my father had a very professorial way in his approach to life, very philosophical, very deep. I mean, it got to a point, and I'm, I'm not exaggerating here, by the age of seven, my conversations with my father were very deep conversations. They were never superficial. And that had a huge impact on me. Uh, how could it not? Mm. 
You know, this is the person that you look up to the most in your life, the person that was obviously putting clothes on your back and food on the table. And nothing with him was ever just surface. It always had some depth to it. So uh, that balance for him uh, stood out for me. Uh, It wasn't joke, 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 joke throughout the day. It was more in depth about life and uh, a general approach to life that I probably took with me more than anything else. How did the sports part of it come in for you? Interesting, because he was not a huge sports fan, but because I was into it, he got into it, and he wanted to bond in in a way. He he didn't hate sports. It just wasn't a huge part of his life. He had had two daughters from a previous marriage, so there was no connection there in the sports world. He grew up, he dropped out of high school, Erasmus Hall High School, as a 16-year-old to travel in big bands. He was a gifted trumpet player and played with the likes of Buddy Rich, like legit people. He was that good. And sports was just not that big a part of his life. Grew up in Brooklyn, so was a Dodger fan. Like, what was your love? What would spark your passion? So when the Dodgers left, he adopted the Mets because they were the National League team and we were living in Queens. We were 10 minutes from Shea. And I... I just found a love of the memorization more than anything else. I had a very active brain. I wanted to put it to use. And I'm, I'm sure similar to you, Chris, I think a lot of sportscasters have this, this shared experience, at least of our age. I just wanted to fill my brain up with, with good stuff, with, information. And for me, it was baseball. It was baseball statistics. It was baseball biographies. Hmm. Baseball was everything. My father bought me the baseball encyclopedia. He allowed me to sign up for Baseball Digest. I just consumed as much as I could. And I did it on a daily basis. Every weekend, the baseball game of the week on NBC with Vin Scully, Joe Garagiola, if it was the B game, Bob Costas and Tony Kubek and Marv Albert doing the pregame, whatever I could do to get my hands on more baseball information. And my father just saw that I had a love for it. So he then got into it. He got into the Mets because I was into the Mets. And, you know, again, just based on circumstance, the Mets had a PR guy before Jay Horowitz by the name of, uh, I think it was Tim Hamilton, if I remember correctly. And Tim called my dad up. The Xerox commercials had blown up and said, hey, we'd like to invite you over to Shea uh, to meet Joe Torrey, the manager, meet the players and uh, do a photo shoot. We'll get some PR here in the New York area. And he did. And he brought me. And PM Magazine did a story. And there was a blurb in the New York Post. And then this was 1978. So in the 79 yearbook, if you go back for the Mets, there's five pictures of (laughs) my father in the Monk's outfit with Joe Torre, Lenny Randall, Pat Zachary, Lee Mazzilli. And now I get to meet all of them. And Lenny Randall gives me a bat. Lee Mazzilli gives me a helmet. It was the greatest day of my life. It might still be the greatest day of my life, (laughs) but it was at that time, the best day of my life. And he just saw the, the love that I had. And I think he saw it as a conduit because he wasn't around a lot. And this was a way to stay close and to check in and ask me about the game and talk about the Mets and baseball. And even if he wasn't studying, I was, so I did most of the talking, but it was a really nice way for us to feel connected, even though geographically there were many, many, many weeks where it was just me and a live-in housekeeper in Forest Hills going about our day-to-day life. Elsa. Elsa Nunez. <laughs> yeah. See how much there I was know. Elsa Nunez. <laughs> there was Marcia Amaya. There was Enid Duncan. Who, who did you sit next to in seventh grade? 
Marilyn sang, <laughs> but I mean, that's well, it's funny because you, an easy one. You talked about your active brain and, and, and the memorization part of it. Yeah. Um, it, I was going to put you through a little test and we didn't talk about this prior. So this is not a setup. This is like <laughs> legit. I'm going to throw this at you because we, I, my wife brought this up when we were talking about you. She knew I was going to be interviewing you, talking to you today. And, you know, you know, Laura very well. And yes, and she was like, you know, we, we were on vacation and, and we had a big group and, and we everybody calls Laura uh, Julie McCoy because she's like the cruise director. <laughs> yes. And um, so I was like, she's like, we got to ask Ian about his, his, you know, his photographic memory. And I would say, <laughs> yes, here's a test. This is probably a layup because I think I know this one. Okay. The actress that played Julie McCoy in The Love Boat. It was Lauren Twos. I knew. I knew but I here's knew. the thing. But l- let me let me just stop you for a moment because <laughs> I want to be as upfront as possible about this. There's no doubt there was a time in my life where I had an absolute photographic memory. Anything that entered stayed and yeah. stayed for a very long time. And I can tell you that I got cocky with it because <laughs> I could look at a roster and I could memorize those names very quickly. Mm. And early in my broadcast career, it was a huge help. Sure. Especially then when I started doing multiple games, multiple sports a week. I don't know what year it was, Chris. It happens to all of us. There was a day where I recognized that my bandwidth was not what it once was. And I think a lot of it, in all sincerity, has to do with doing oftentimes two football games a week. So you're yeah. talking about 53 players on a team. That's 106 players in that game. Multiply by two. So it's 212 players that you have to have some working knowledge of. And then throw NBA in there. Three games a week. Throw a college basketball game in there. And somewhere along the line, I think my brain said to me, okay, dude, Enough. Remember all of those Love Boat episodes that you had committed to memory when Pat Harrington was a guest star? See ya. There's a thing yeah. called IMDB. We have to clear out Use some it. of the hard drive. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. the, the computer's not running at an optimum level right now. We have to clear out no. some of this hard drive stuff. Completely. Yeah. Completely. I was going to say, give me, remember. Remember later on in the love boat, uh, Gavin McLeod, who played the captain of the ship. His yes, his daughter came on, and she became like Vicky's. Well, her name was Vicky in the show. Y- yes, I was going to say uh, bonus points. The the actress that played Vicky, I believe it was uh, Liz Whalen. <laughs> <laughs> Also, also in the movie Airplane, she was the the young sick child in the back of the plane where they knocked out her wires. So if there's even added bonus points, I believe I should get them. (laughs) Chris, I was basically an only child growing up. I had two sisters, but they were from a, a different marriage. I never lived with them. So I can't begin to tell you how much television I consumed and how many movies I watched and how much I read about sports and entertainment and music. It really was my siblings in many way. It was my companionship. Yeah. And I can, I can catalog a lot of things based on that. And uh, I'm not sure how much it helps me other than in the podcast world and occasionally on a broadcast, <laughs> but at the time it, it dominated my brain. Waves. I, well, no, and it just, I, I feel like you've done what it is that you were meant to do. I think you've done everything that you have wanted to do. I yeah. think you're, you're now you're doing more um, perhaps than you've ever done in your, in your career. And, and and you're trying to, you know, trying to compartmentalize all that stuff. That's it. Um, so before I let you go, I, there, I could, we could, you know, it's, this is literally, like kind of, we that? could do an entire day. We could yeah. do a marathon podcast it, where we just keep the mics open. And we could do a podcast of just our lunches yeah. with me, you, and Capper 
And I think it would be a popular podcast. I'm wearing, oh, by the way, I'm wearing my t-shirt, play hard, the Tim, ba- Tim Cattrall <laughs> basketball right. uh, camp today to give him a little, just bring his essence in here. Um, and you do so much and you're on the road constantly during the course of the football season, the basketball season. Um, were you able to just turn it off? Like when, when, the, when the season ended and you found yourself just, with nothing to do, or at least, you know, from a standpoint, you had no games to do. Uh, Are you able to just turn it off? I've gotten better at it. I was not able for a very long time. And I I did for many years take on assignments during the summer. I would do tennis events or I did track and field for eight years. I do some golf events occasionally for CBS when they wanted me to do some of the the extra broadcasts that they were providing for DirecTV or CBSSports.com. And I have turned a lot down, uh, I must say, over, over the last probably five years, I finally realized that I needed to turn the battery off. I needed to find some more balance and I needed to wake up not just one day, but a series of days with nothing on my calendar, nothing. Hmm. And I've realized that I'm actually really good at doing nothing. (laughs) I could build a whole day around picking up my dry cleaning. It's not a problem for me. So it's a little, it's a little scary in that sense of, oh, wow, I could get used to this. But then when it's time to, to get back into the routine of it, it does require a, a certain mindset. You and I are both really fortunate that we get to do this and we enjoy our jobs and we enjoy the people that we work with. All of that, I, I don't take it for granted. But I do have to psych myself up a little bit before the real hard travel starts to pick up. And just finding sometimes even a mental happy place. Yeah. Had a flight for a Jets preseason game the other day, and some of those issues start popping up again, and you have to take a a step back and not get crazed over someone cutting you off in line or (laughs) uh, not recognizing how to get off the plane in a civil manner. It's okay. Yeah. And- I remind myself constantly of this. This this is not a big deal. Life's going to be okay. We're all good. <laughs> so I I don't know if that's some maturity more than anything else or survival instincts. Yeah, so you can't. You can't. You just you can't be that way and maintain the amount of control and balance that you need to have in order to do this job well and to live. A productive existence. Yeah, it, it, it's got to, you, you got to be wary of burning out. Yeah. And I think it could very easily happen to you. And then what you, the last thing you want is for something that's enjoyable to then not be enjoyable. And I think you got to, I remember going to Italy one time when I was younger and uh, I had this tour guide in Capri and these American tourists that we were with, you know, the guy goes to the tour guide, he says, uh, the guy's name was Luigi. He goes, hey, Luigi. Um, what do you do during the winter time? <laughs> and Luigi looked at him and said, "What do you mean? What do I do?" <laughs> he goes, eh, "I do nothing in the winter time." He goes, "Yeah, you know, like they just great." There. He goes, "You Americans always got to be doing something." You know, like no, sometimes yeah, like like my shirt says, "Play hard." You you got to be able to play hard and work hard. You know, really, yeah. when you're going to do nothing, do nothing. Yeah, and I, I've noticed in in my situation, and I think there was a time where I let it annoy me, and then I realized, hey, it, it's not your thing. It, it's other people's things. And it's it's not even something that they intend. But the natural question, no matter what you're doing, the natural question from other people is, so what's next? Yeah. So what else? And I had this... This wonderful thing happened to me that I'm going to call the final four yeah. for CBS and Turner. And look, it it's amazing. And I am so 
thrilled to be a part of the event and the trust that they're putting in me to do this. It means a great deal. But even after that, I had someone reach out that day when the news leaked out and they said, that's so great. I'm thrilled for you. What else? What, what more? <laughs> what about this? Like, so when do they give me the Super Bowl? Yeah, dude. Yeah. Like, <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> it's all, and again, it wasn't coming from a negative place. So I think I yeah. realized somewhere along the way, it, it's, it's people that want to take the journey with you, which is wonderful that, that people feel connected in that manner. Um, but that's a great way to put it. And I now have to remind myself of Luigi, which is, <laughs> what do you mean? This is it. This is the thing. Yeah. I'm doing it. I, I think that's why it, people, it doesn't work out in retirement for people. Yeah. You know, they just, they like, their life is so identified by what they did and they have to have their purpose every day. It's enjoying just doing nothing at some point is, is there, it, it, I could think it can be enjoyable as well. Cause then, you know, you're getting back on the, I guess that's, what's different about Maybe. retirement is like, it's never coming back. At least, you know, in the summer it's coming back at some point. Yeah. Elisa and I have had many conversations in regards to the balance of life and then also knowing when it's time, like yeah. that's okay to have a finality to this. I, I know a lot of broadcasters say it, and then they don't necessarily live up to it. But I truly believe, and I'm saying it to you, not only on the podcast, but to you as my very close friend, that I'm not doing this forever. There's going to come a day where I said, hey, this was great, hmm. and I'm ready to not do this now. Well, hopefully we have about 20 or so years before that conversation. <laughs> See if we're still Oof, doing the I'm podcast. I'm doing the math, then. carry the one. I don't know. Just, yeah, hopefully I'm still, you know, we're doing the podcast and maybe you can make that announcement on the podcast. I oh. think that would be appreciative of the time. <laughs> you wear that shirt, I'll do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, um, I have so yeah, we have so much, but I, I want to be uh, cognizant of your time because it's starting for you again now. I mean, you've got a preseason game coming up again this week, I'm sure. Uh, what do you got coming up this week? Yeah, Jets, Buccaneers. Okay. Saturday night. Uh, had the Jets and the Panthers in Charlotte last week. Heading out to Jets camp later this week. New vibes there, as you can well imagine. And uh, it's funny, a lot of the same things that I could see on the net side of things, I see and am experiencing on the Jets side of things of relevance. Yeah. They really want to be relevant and they see a window where they've got a whole lot of talent and they felt like they were one position away from being an elite team in this league. Now you have to actually see it synthesize out on the field, but on paper, they look like a quality football team. And yeah. our production meeting with Aaron Rodgers, Chris, I've been doing this. This will be my 26th year doing NFL on CBS. That was a top five production meeting in my career. That's how yeah. honest he was, forthright, open, all of it. He was fantastic. So they haven't played a real game yet. Yeah. Obviously, things can change. But right now, it's exactly where they want it to be with his mindset, the team, how they've responded, his presence, and how it's changed things there. So they're going to be an interesting storyline throughout the season, no doubt. Do you think you could do a darkness retreat? Mm. You say you have that active mind? Yeah. Is that something you think you could do? Or would that be like your version of hell? Could I bring a DVD of Stripes? <laughs> no. Do, do no I, I, get think, I don't think that would, one I think that would go that against the... I think that would go against the whole philosophy of it. Man, that is a... That's a hell of a question. You know what? Answer that on the next podcast, the next time. All right. This together. gives me time to ponder yeah. or to work on it. Interesting. That I you think went. I could. I, I, like, there's a part of me that really believes it. But I must say, you know, we, we had wonderful neighbors that lived next door to us with three sons. All three played collegiate lacrosse, so all athletic. The oldest of which, great guy, highly successful. And he's now 
you know, in, in his almost 40s, late 30s. But a number of years ago, uh, he turned to me one day when we were talking in the driveway. He said, I don't want to run something by you. I said, yeah, yeah, go ahead. He said, uh, I really believe I could play slot receiver in the NFL. <laughs> and I said, Brian, you wouldn't make it one play. <laughs> One snap, you'd be done. He goes, no, 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 no. Hear me out. <laughs> Athletic. No, I, I really feel like I could be a good route runner. I could absorb hits. I go, what? I, let's stop right there, Brian. No chance. <laughs> Zero. Yeah. Zero point zero zero. And we had a running thing for a few years. And then, I don't know, maybe five years after that, he matured. You know, maybe he was 22, 23, 24 when he said it. Now he's about to be 30. And he turned to me once. He's like, gosh, you were so right. <laughs> I, I would have had no shot. <laughs> yeah, so, so a lot of things you I think know. you I could say, do. But yeah. I say I could do it, the darkness retreat. But maybe Not you sure. would emerge from it and you would be able to recall now all those 70 sitcom characters oh. again. That's a great point. <laughs> you might free up. I would have more Ted McGinley knowledge than I would ever need. <laughs> Ted McGinley, who has has emerged with a, a renaissance performance in in uh, in the new the new show on uh, Apple Plus, uh, Shrinking. Oh, he was great. Great. Everybody was great. Yeah. He was but, great in particular, just playing exactly the type. Yes. Never, never modifying. Always knowing what you're going to get. Good for Ted McGinley. <laughs> um, even Springsteen does Born to Run every night. Um, I, always, I always end these things with the, the Jim Balvano thing about laugh, cry, think. So you went laugh, I, a movie that makes you laugh. You went Stripes just now. Would that be First half. number one? First half of Stripes yeah. is, is a near perfect film. When they go overseas, it, it goes a little sideways. Still funny, but the first half... I'm not sure you could put together an hour worth of comedy at that level. Scene after scene after scene after scene. It's a masterpiece. Is there a movie that makes you cry or has made you cry? Oh, man. I was on a plane. I'm not a huge crier in general. And at movies, look. It happens, it gets you. And it's not because I don't want to. It's just you know, whether or not you can hit that spot. But I was on a plane, and this is going back where the screens would come down from the ceiling of the plane. So depending yeah. upon your seat, you either, ha either had a really good angle or you had a bad angle. Yeah. Were you smoking a cigarette on the plane at the time? Too, <laughs> yeah, not not quite that, that, that far. But I do remember the last time that, that I flew on a plane where there was a smoking section and I was doing NFL Europe, 1997. <laughs> I was on a Lufthansa flight and I was in the, f the last row of non-smoking and the guy behind me was in the first row of smoking. <laughs> and <laughs> just thinking to myself, guys go, he's, you know, he's, he's smoking a heater and <laughs> just hitting me right in the back of the head. I go, what, what are yeah. we accomplishing here? Anyway, so I had a good angle on, on the movie and I have a big guy, bearded fellow sitting next to me. We don't say a word to one another on this flight. And the movie starts and now you plug in and you have to watch when it's on. It's not on demand. And it's The Notebook, which I had never seen. And I'm watching the movie and they bring over the meal. It's like a steak, like a hockey puck. And I'm digging into it. And again, I make no eye contact with this guy. Nothing. We, we have had no back and forth. And you get now to the end of the movie. And I don't know what's happening. These salty deposits are coming out of my eyes. I'm like, oh my, I can't stop it. And I turn to the right and the guy in the same exact moment turns to me and he's bawling. <laughs> and we're looking at each other. <laughs> what is happening here? And you, know, you take the headset off and now I, I talk to the guy for a minute. I was like, it got you. He's like, it sure did. <laughs> I, so the notebook did make me cry. It did on a plane. Um, 
Uh, finally, if I could put it, if you could put a slogan that you live by on, on the outside of Barclay Center on the Oculus as your yeah. sort of entrance slogan, what, what, what do you think it might be? Don't be an asshole. <laughs> that, that would be my slogan. That to me is the secret to life. Golden rule. Yeah, we, we all have choices. So many of them all day, every day. And the big one that sticks with me for most people is just that. If you just followed that credo, life would be so much better. But that's that's the one that, if I could put that on the Oculus, it probably would turn some heads. But <laughs> it would also help society. That's a great way to end things. Ian Eagle, thank you so much, man.